Hello ladies and gentlemen and everyone in between, I'm Amanda. Emily is off studying for the bar exam, so it will just be me tonight playing Vampire the Masquerade Shadows of New York. Unfortunately, Count Dracula never drinks wine, but I do. So, if you see me occasionally taking a sip, that's what this is in this glass. Let's continue on with Julia and her story. She was just about to call it a night um, after visiting the priest, so let's see where she goes from here. I'm home. Finally, you doing all right? Oh, so she did maintain a contact from her human life. That's interesting. Fine, I guess. Why aren't you asleep? I figured it's finally time for me to become more of a night owl. We talked about making our schedules sync better. Watch your vitamin D. I'd kill to have your skin. Would be a shame to waste it. Shouldn't have smoked so much before you got bitten, sweetheart. Should have shared your skincare routine with me back when I was still breathing. I can't just be going around sharing my one secret weapon. It's top secret stuff. MKU Ultra, MK Ultra level, Jeffrey Epstein's current whereabouts level. I'd have to kill you if I told you. Dying sounds good. I have a secret weapon too. Love you too, hun. I think I have a secret weapon too. Sounds a bit flirty. Fair. My kind also has a secret anti-aging weapon after all. But hey, if you don't care about that, psh, and what would that be? Andrenico? Andrenochrome? Close. Spirit cooking. Uh, just so we're clear, you're shitting me, right? Of course I'm shitting you. We just drink bl we just drink blood. Nothing too satanic about that. Funny, because whenever I see your chest, I'm surprised there's no cross-shaped burn mark there. Well, since you mention it, uh... Never mind, I feel a little more self-conscious than usual tonight. Don't. You want me to do your makeup before you go to sleep? No need. No need? Weren't you supposed to have some sort of big party tomorrow night? Huh. I was involved in the backstage stuff. What makes you think I was invited? Because you're the coolest, cutest, and most all-around amazing person I know. It'd be insane not to put you on the shortlist. Believe it or not, but most vampires are pretty insane. Interdimensional psychic vampire level insane? Because that's how crazy that it'd have to be to ignore you like this. Yeah, I would say so. Fuck them, then. A big bunch of posh dicks. They hate you because they ain't you. But they'll see. Jesus, how do you do it? Do what? You always assault me with so much of this weird, stupid positivity that I can't react to it without completely shift shifting my mental attitude. How do you do it? Oh, the answer is easy. You remember how I told you we have this spiritual connection? I can sense what you feel and want. You can sense what I feel too, if you really focus. Yeah, I think I called it a big load of bullshit. Said a girl who talks to ghosts. Watch this, Agent Scully. I sensed you feeling down, and I realized what you really need to end this night. She points to one of her drawers. It's the one where she keeps her supply of... Ketamine? Come on. What? No, wrong drawer. We're not melting de- We're not meeting demons. We're meeting angels. MDMA? Ding, ding, ding. Took it half an hour ago. Perfect timing. Thanks to our spiritual connection. Ready to fly away? mood isn't right. I need music. Got a special sound cop playlist ready to go, prepared specifically to uplift one Julia Sawinski. Just give me a sign and I'll press play. Jesus, you're impossible. That's why you love me, I 
hope. I give up. Come here. Let me have a taste of you. Maybe this one time the high won't end. Oh, okay, it's just to rest tonight. There's nothing else to do, so let's rest. I leave Dakota's apartment as soon as the sun goes down. Yesterday was fun, but I always feel a little nervous when I spend too much time with her. She never lets me escape from being the center of attention. It's exhausting. At least, the less time I spend with her, the happier she is to see me again. It's a tricky act to balance, though. I am grateful for her presence in my life, but never mind. What's on my list of chores tonight? Ah yes, the one, the only, only one thing. Don't show up for the party at the art hole. Well, this is a rare night when I don't have anything to do. Might as well take a trip around the city and see what's up. And maybe fix myself a little drink while I'm at it. All right, there are two things here. First one is breaking the habit. I need to break out of this mood, go somewhere I never visit, something I tend to avoid. Think, Julio. What is the least you place to go and live a little? The other one is a walk in the park. In life, I wasn't especially fond of parks. Now, as one of the kindred, I can finally see the appeal. Past midnight they become a surprisingly good hunting ground. I think I'm gonna do breaking the habit. That sounds a little bit more fun. What was I thinking? I mean, even the most hopeless introverts yearn for company every now and then, be it the company of someone they know or a total stranger re revealing themselves to be the soulmate they've always sought. Even for someone as neurotic as me, there's something enthralling in the idea of briefly trading your individualism for a place in the crowd. You can just wander around and stare like a peeping tom hidden in plain sight. If there's anything missing from the shell of my previous social life, it's that intangible sensation, being a part of a living mass. But really, Coney Island of all places? What was I thinking? Surely it's my... id finally revealing what I'd been missing all along. All my sick soul really wanted to, was to nibble on a Williams Caramel Apple while taking an overpriced Wonder, ride, wonder Wheel ride. Well, I'm here. Might as well at least try one of those tourist traps. Mm. Thunderbolt, Spook Spookorama, or Wonder Wheel? Well, she did say Wonder Wheel, but I think I'm going to go with Thunderbolt because that seems a bit more exciting. Of all the nearby roller coasters, this one seems to attract the least attention. Perfect. I take a seat in the most weathered cart, buckle up, and prepare to force some enjoyment out of myself. After a few minutes' ride, I realize why everyone gives this place a wide berth. To say it was underwhelming would be an undeserved compliment. Not that I expected anything else, but still, I'm not sure what I was hoping for. Amidst the crowd, clouds of cigarette smoke, I notice an old woman perched silently by the wall. She looks like one giant wrinkle, but her gaze is lively and pierces right through me. I put the crumpled package out of, out of my back pocket, my last smoke. As I raise the lighter, some pompous dick preoccupied with his visibly bored girlfriend shoves the cigarette out of my hand. Somehow it's his half-assed apology that pisses me off the most. The urge to drink him dry is strong, but I let it pass. I look beneath my feet. I can hear the old crone cackling as my cigarette sinks into the oil only puddle in the vicinity. Fuck. I turn toward the exit and notice some brawny dude closing in on me. The way he's dressed has some uncanny aura as Steve Buscemi walking through a high school corridor in a skater outfit. Except that Steve Buscemi is a thousand times cooler than this guy. He gets right in my face and hands me a cigarette, pulling up a rather annoying smirk. Blockhead. <laughs> Having a bad night, sweetheart? I'm gonna say it was fine up to this point just because I get the feeling we're supposed to eat this guy and might as well drag the interaction out a little bit more. It was fine until you came along. 
It completely disregards my reluctance and starts waving his hands erratically like a second-hand mime. That's a shame, but hey, you seem like a girl who likes to have fun. I know these things. I have something here, just for you. Wanna check it out? Throughout his bizarre peacock dance, his colorful wristband pops up from behind his sleeve. Shit, man, how clueless can you be? Is this a hidden camera show? Or maybe you're just some newbie being hazed by the rest of your undercover unit. I'm gonna fake curiosity. He really thinks I'll take the bait. Unbelievable. Okay, smartass, you're on. Well, what do you say? Keep talking. Why won't you follow me to my stash? I've got dope. Wow, just wow. Let me stop you right there, Tony Montana. Less than 10 seconds and you rush straight to the finish line. Also dope, you poor soul. You're out of your depth. Who put you up to this? I seem to have struck a nerve and he doesn't know how to handle it. Come on, big guy, just give me a reason. Well, fuck you too, bitch. Now that's just rude and begs for a reaction. walk away. Dominate, drop your, drop your act for everyone to see. Dominate, scare the haunted house visitors. Well, I'm not going to drop the act because that's part, that's not part of the masquerade. But I kind of want to see what happens if I do show something off. So I'm going to say scare the haunted house visitors. He freezes in place as I gaze into his eyes. I point my finger at the haunted house ride. Go inside. Pretend to be a real monster. The cop quickly waddles through the front entrance of the Spookorama, leaving the ticket seller flabbergasted with impotence. A moment later, I see a member of the staff wrestling with the wannabe drug dealer as he's doing his best werewolf impression and tearing off his t-shirt. Two casually dressed guys sharing similar light blue wristbands jump to the scene, taking out their badges and frantically trying to stop their buddy from biting them. That's enough to put a smile on my face. Seeing the old crone rolling in the aisles, laughing her heart out at the pig suddenly makes the whole Coney Island trip worthwhile. She applauds me from afar. No one but me seems to notice. Maybe there is something more to this place after all. I casually wave back at the old lady as I take my leave. Guess that's enough human interaction for one night. Once more to Big Beat Burger. Into the latest fast food joint I'll never know. Into the last fast food joint I'll ever know. I'll have the usual. First time I used this line, I wasn't sure it would work, but I've gained enough notoriety among the staff that it does. The cashier just smiles, nods, and charges me for one black coffee. I can imagine them instructing the newbies. See that emo weirdo? Here's how she is. She always orders a single cup of coffee, nothing else, and she doesn't even drink it. Probably wouldn't take a single sip, even if I was still alive. The stuff is just trash. But at least being a buying customer gives me an excuse to sit here for as long as I want to. I wish I could use one of those self-order kiosks to minimize human contact. But touch screens don't exactly like me. Not too long ago, I managed to blue, to blue screen ten of them in a row. Oh well, the good news is, it doesn't look like I have anything to do tonight bad news is, is because every kindred who matters is having fun at the art hole right now. It's not like I wanted to go, I just wanted them to invite me so that I could tell them to fuck off. I scan the entrance to the restaurant through my peripheral vision. Am I naively hoping someone will come and save me from misery? Guess I am. Please, 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 let somebody come and get me out of here. A prince. A princess. A knight in shining armor. A fairy godmother. A passing huntsman. Big Bad Wolf. Mila Jovovich. Vin Diesel. Azalea Banks. Hell, I'll take anyone at this point. Visualizing. Tapping into the power of my subconscious materializing my dreams. 
Nope, doesn't work. Looks like you're eternally stuck being a nobody in this corner of a shitty restaurant, sweet little Julia. And life's a bitch, and then you don't even die. I pretend to read a book about psychoanalysis I stole from Dakota for a while. Having found it too mentally taxing, I switched to pretending to read a Stephen King book, which I also stole from Dakota. After the terrifying realization that it was written in the last 15 years and therefore contains no amusing drugged out rants about troubled childhood in Maine, I switched back, back to looking at the entrance. That party must be so stuffy and trashy and boring. At this point, I'm no longer looking for salvation. I'm asking for amusement. But it doesn't come. All I get is boring bozos in norm normcore clothes. They walk in, take care of their business without doing anything to amuse me, and walk out. A few minutes after I lose all hope, a tall, elegant man marches in with a spring in his step. He looks around, impatient, irritated. Then he notices the person he was looking for and reacts with visible relief. He gallantly approaches my table, looks at me, and says, There you are. Now that's curious. He shouldn't be here. I think just to be cute, I'll call him Fairy Godmother, just because I think she has a cute relationship with Kadir. What's up? Are you here to be my fairy godmother? Will you give me a wonderful dress and drive me to the party? Oh, but it's past midnight already. My dumb attempt at self-amusement doesn't faze him at all. He doesn't even roll his eyes. He just stares at me blankly. Grab your stuff and get in my car. Now. His tone leaves no room for doubt. Something bad has happened. I want to ask him what, but whatever he's... But whenever he's in his, I will simply ignore all the dumb shit you say mode. I know better than to ask him questions. Instead, I silently follow him to the exit. He guides me to his car. I just hope I haven't messed anything up. Again, I don't think I have, but have I? Kadir's car. As usual, he gave me the back seat. He's always uneasy when the passenger seat is taken. Doesn't want anyone to limit his peripheral vision, he says. It's kind of creepy staring at his eyes in the rearview mirror like that. Normally, I'd catch him observing me in the rearview mirror, but this time he's watching the streets. More tense than usual. Something must have caught him off guard. I've got my seatbelt on and my popcorn ready. What's up? The awkward silence feels like it would last forever. Eventually, he finds the right words and speaks up. Six weeks ago, the prince told me to parlay with the Anarchs in the docks, remember? Yeah, and you made me tag along so I could learn something about politics. As it turned out, politics meant something awfully similar to watching my drunken family shout at each other at a wedding party. There was this man who didn't need to shout to make my blood boil. The meanest one in the room, their leader, white hair, a monocle, musty clothes his fucking Pollock. Scrooge McDuck, yeah, how could I forget? A lot of panache, old-timey bravado, and gendered insults flung my way. What was his name? Something British, made me think of Hollywood. Callahan? Baron Callahan. Douglas Boss Callahan. Right, it's 2020. But the man's opinions and ideas were stuck in 1920. Weren't the Anarchs supposed to be the progressive option? I never understood why they put up with him. Yeah, in Bloodlines, the Anarchs were the progressive ones, and the uh, Camarilla were the stuffy ones, but we'll, we'll see what happens. He has his ways of predicting which way the wind will blow. Anytime Camarilla or the SI hit the Anarchs, it was the factions opposed to him that were hurt, the luckiest bastard in the world thought you didn't believe in luck. I don't, but it sure looks like his luck has finally run out tonight. Huh. Wait, don't tell me. I'm gonna kill him if he's dead. 
Kadir doesn't seem like the kind that would kill someone, so I think... And the way that he spoke, it makes me think that he's dead. So I'm gonna say he's dead. He's dead? Deader than dead? I'm 99% sure the bastard met his final death. How do you know? We've got trustworthy sources in the Anarch inner circles. Looks like all hell is about to break loose. There's an emergency meeting at the art hall. Jesus, and you're bringing me with you? Why? Because you were on the way. Because I could. Because I should. You might not be important to the members of the court, but you're still an asset to the sect. Symbolically, at least. I can justify sneaking you into the party, claiming it's for your own protection. My sweet fairy godmother in a luxury carriage. <laughs> Wait a minute, though. The party is still happening? I called the prince. I told her the best course of action is stopping it and starting listing and started listing security protocols I have prepared for these sort of situations. She interrupted me halfway though through and told me we will discuss the subject face to face. Doesn't sound like she was interested. Party is that important, huh? Politics. Politics is that important. I don't know if he's trying to convince me or himself. And once again, politics sound an awful lot like a bunch of party-loving assholes shouting at each other. Don't worry, this isn't the kind of, how should I call it, governing issue the likes of you and I tend to deal with. And how would you describe the governing issues we tend to deal with? Shoveling ourselves out of shit. As usual, he seems a little embarrassed for cussing, or for being too honest. Either way, it's cute. No argument here. And that's where the conversation ends. We stay silent as the car rides off toward the unknown. I'm not a New York City Baron. The Baron of New York City, if you please. What's more, a memory of an old douchebag who thought he could rule the world crosses my mind. Well, it looks like the world has left him behind. Sayonara, asshole. And here I am, at the only place I didn't expect to visit tonight, the art hole. Guessing by the sounds, the inside seems lively. Even if they know it's an emergency, they simply don't care. What are you standing around for? You still need an invitation? No idea. Do I? I think the bouncer will let you in. There's a bouncer? Yes, and he's standing right in front of you. Just start walking, whelp. And here I am, among partying elites. It's as stuffy and boring as I expected, but hey, at least it's exclusive. The title Panhard came up with for these yearly gatherings is called Celebrations of Power, an invitation to re-examine the relationship between our undead bodies and the spaces they inhabit. The week-long event is packaged as a sort of performance art piece, meant to make the kindred who are involved celebrate their potential instead of despairing at their monstrous nature. We need to counter-program the omnipresent images of tragic vampirism with images that remind us we have inherited the Earth and are now free to remake it in our image, is the way that our prince puts it. To this end, she organizes a series of exhibits, concerts, fireworks, parties, business meetings, etc., etc. Of course, the parties and business meetings are the most important. My prince? Kadir, finally. A saint with angelic wings, a holy patron of New York City. I take a good look around. Half the figures here are dressed like they are attending a masked ball. The other half are religious figures, either demonic or saintly. I have to admit, I don't fully understand the theme here. I know Panhard based it on psychomagic, a sort of shamanic psychotherapy using the power of art. Simply put, it's a holy mask mass, an unholy mask, 
mass, <laughs> why am I saying mask, in equal measures, a set of rituals meant to make the participants wholeheartedly accept they're both the worst and best this earth has to offer. Put on this mask at the very least, you're standing out here. I heard the aesthetic basics basis for these parties is the black mass on the film Eyes Wide Shut. Some think this decision means Panhard is tone deaf, but it's quite the contrary. She knows the Anarchs are constantly looking for ways to undermine her through art and rhetoric that point out glaring contradictions in her theoretically benevolent role. But instead of denying and suppressing aesthetics designed to criticize the elites, she embraces them. Instead of risking a Streisand effect, she effectively defangs the opposition. The resistance becomes part of the system, and both the Camarilla and Anarchs get the same message. Don't think of it as a pathology, think of it as the new normal. I'll collect the key advisors. They've already been told to come here. I don't think there's a need for us to hold the meeting in a particularly secluded place. We'll just do it over here. Are you certain? Absolutely. Wait, is that Miss Sawinski I see behind you? I'm going to say good evening. Good evening. I clutched her on my way here, because of her role as a La Sombra representative. Just say, political hostage, you people have made it perfectly clear what's going to happen with my parents back in Chicago if I go against you. I realized she might become a target and decided to hide her at the art hole. Putting all my eggs in one basket will make my job easier. I will look for a safe place for her to spend the night. Let her stay with you for now, Alasami. Time is of the essence. I didn't notice him sneak up on us. Nice getup. Are you absolutely sure? But of course. Everything we say here is going to become an open secret in a matter of minutes. Prince Panhard has already come up with the appropriate messaging. Out of the corner of my eye, I spot an elderly vampire guiding a young, fashionable human girl toward the basement. Led like a lamb to the slaughter best not to think too deeply about what's going on underneath this place. Before everyone gets here, I'd like to secure the perimeter. Easy now, Elisami. All the appropriate security protocols for you are already active. Me and the Prince have already pulled some strings as well. The situation is mostly under control. Mostly under control. Never let anyone sleep any easier. Alasmai. I have been calling him Alasami. It's Alasmai. Oh my gosh. Alasmai. I know that as the prince's sword, you're aching for blood, but you have to accept that, like most weapons known to men, you're most effective hidden in the sheath. Listen here now. Looks like a fascinating philosophical discussion in the making, but sadly I'm forced to interrupt. Prince Panhard? All of a sudden, Samira appears between the two men, her calm and collected voice completely changing the atmosphere, as expected for a self-professed protector of the peace. Samira, I hope you're enjoying yourself. To be quite honest, I feel out of place. She nods and smiles at me, probably to signal she takes solace in not being the only person in the room who feels like a fish out of water. Especially now, seeing as I heard this meeting is meant for those of greater stature than mine. Nonsense. We have a delicate matter to discuss, one that might require severe judgment down the road. I think you understand why I wished for a child of Hakim to be involved. Of course. What is with that expression on your face, Kadir? He quickly collects himself. Look who's joining us. The High Regent of the Chantry of the Five Burrows, Lady Isling Sturbridge, walks up to our group in an outfit I would have never imagined her in, pretending everything is on par for the course. Prince Panhard, the Sheriff, the Harpy, the Banu Hakim Primogen. Are we still waiting for someone? He's almost here. Shining even more brightly than usual, Isling. I adore your outfit, Samira. Wish the prince allowed the same amount of effort for me. 
I, for one, am glad she didn't. I particularly love those horns. Thank you for reminding me. I put them on at the prince's behest, but I believe she has more than enough fun. No, not yet. Uh, well, this will do for now. But you're not off the hook yet. I paid a costly price to see you like this. Both Kadir's and the prince's voices are strained whenever they attempt humor. Their minds are obviously elsewhere, and it's not a happy place. Arturo, on the other hand, seems calm. We all celebrate our power in different ways, I suppose. Now, what is this about? Oh, she took the horns off. Just a moment. Over here, Addison. The Camarilla's infamous spokesman appears, pushed toward us in a wheelchair by his servant. Helen? Everyone? I certainly hope this is something important. What a commanding tone. Seeing as Payne can't communicate normally, the servant relays his words to us instead, and he's posh and snobby enough to make me believe I'm listening to his master's voice. Carter won't be joining us? He gave me fair warning he might not make it tonight. I've messaged him the details. I'll have to find time to meet him later, then. Finding time, searching for lost time, I swear it's all I do nowadays, and there's never enough. I guess now you understand why I insisted that this event must last all week. So many esteemed guests, many of, the, of them from out of town, each deserving at least a few hours. The figure in the wheelchair waves his hand impatiently. Yes, yes, let's just cut the chase now, shall we? That might be the wisest course of action. My prince? Arturo? My prince, everyone. Let me begin by stressing these important points. The situation is largely under control. The negotiations are underway, and the situation is more tense than dangerous. We are safe. Let me repeat. We are safe. And with that out of the way, here's the big news. Baron Callahan, de facto leader of the Anarchs in New York City, met his final death in his office tonight. How did you find out? We have a good friend near his office. Their intel is as accurate as it gets. We've also established a negotiation channel with the Anarchs. They gave us all the confirmation we need. Was our court involved in his destruction? I look at her in disbelief. So does everyone else. Not that the same thought hasn't passed through my head, but to simply exclaim it like that. Oh, spare me the virtue, si the virtue signaling. I thought we were being transparent here. I don't give a damn if we took care of Callahan or not. I just want to have a clear idea of what I'm dealing with. Yes, a clear answer. I need that, too. To my knowledge, none of us present here ordered his destruction, nor did we participate in it, unless someone wants to confess. It's now or never. Of course, nobody speaks up. Arturo pretends to clear his throat. That's our official position as well. The Camarilla's ruling body had nothing to do with it, and for all intents and purposes, his Anarch contenders had more interest in removing him than we did. That interest is sure to manifest in one way now. His former enemies will prop him up as a martyr for the cause. Yes, which is why we sadly can't just leave the Anarchs to their own devices. As much as we'd like to avoid recognizing their sect in any way, we've offered to assist them in an official investigation. Addison Payne's wrinkled face contorts slightly. Let me just ask you one question. You do realize those curs have no respect for our traditions, yes? We do, Addison. But as a veteran politician, you should be deeply familiar with the words controlled opposition. Yes, for now, it's impossible to fully contain the Anarch threat in New York. For now, our only option is to prop up a candidate who will offer the least resistance to our future plans for the city. 
we extend our hand to the most promising contender, giving him a way to present himself as a diplomat, a man of reasonable compromise. The rabble falls in line. The purists grow angry and alienated. We've already contacted the best possible person in their sect. He will oversee the investigation, and it's in his best interest to show he's able to resolve the situation calmly. Is that good enough? Addison ponders the question for a while, then waves his hand again. It is. Proceed. Funny thing, nobody's paying attention to me right now. Keep in mind, Mr. Payne, our man's people will still barely tolerate us, and the situation is volatile. The other factions within that sorry excuse for a sect might still try to escalate the conflict. I will do my best to solve the situation as fast as possible. How so? Kadir is momentarily taken aback by Arturo's question. I volunteer to coordinate the case with the Anarchs, of course. I refuse. You have more important duties to focus on. Once more, Kadir is stunned. I'll do respect, Prince, but if you don't consider me capable of, ta of tackling this issue and attending to my usual duties at the same time, I think you gravely underestimate me. Your penchant for working yourself to the bone is well known and appreciated by everyone in this room, Sheriff, but so is your perfectionism. If we do grant your wish and let you investigate while still fulfilling your, your routine obligations, can you guarantee you're going to give both tasks, both these tasks your best? I can guarantee something very close to my best. Close to your best doesn't cut it, Alasmai. Not when the vul vultures are out, of, are out in force. Callahan's destruction is sure to cause unrest among the Anarchs, and there's an obvious outlet for their pent-up rage. I want to make this perfectly clear. The celebrations will continue as planned, no matter what. This is why your presence here is absolutely necessary, Sheriff. We rely on your constant protection. Of course, my prince. We must be on constant vigil for a few days. Alasmai's sword must constantly must be constantly pointed at the enemies surrounding us. The timing of the Baron's destruction is impeccable. The Anarch leaders are sure to point at us and claim we're shamelessly celebrating his end. Does anybody believe it's just a coincidence? Murders are messy, almost as messy as politics. It's impossible to reliably predict the outcome of any violent action. I think it'd be wise for us to brace for a lot of unfortunate coincidences, Iceland. In any case, the rabble can't get the impression that their power struggles are of great concern to us, but they also can't think we have something to hide. Which brings me to my point. We do need a symbolic gesture, one displaying expertly measured intensity. My best bet is a humble diplomatic envoy, a low-level official acting as an investigator of sorts. I implore you, Prince. Kadir. He bites his tongue and struggles to collect himself. I rarely see him lose his temper, at least where the Camarilla is involved. What's going on? I wonder about your suggestion for this role. After all, it's not particularly prestigious, but carries a lot of responsibility. We're still talking about a Camarilla representative. Oh, I think there's a very obvious candidate. Both he and Kadir look at me simultaneously. Everyone else in the room does too. Now wait a second, he can't possibly mean. Miss Julia. Once again, your full name eludes me at the moment. Am I allowed to speak? Maybe I should wait for permission? Before I make up my mind, the sheriff sighs deeply and speaks up. Sawinski. Miss Julia Sawinski, right. I understand you used to be an investigative journalist before your embrace. That's correct. What about it? That was a long time ago. I'm going to say that's correct, because I still want to be res respectful to them. And it wasn't too long ago. You still have some memory of what you're doing and some habits that you already keep after a year. Uh, that's correct. 
Among others, the Banu Hakim primogen insisted that you are worthy of greater privileges and should be given a chance to prove yourself. Samira measures Arturo with suspicion. Yes? Do you still think she's capable? She looks me deep in the eye. I swear, she's telepathically trying to tell me, please, 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 don't fuck this up, you dumbass little white girl. <laughs> of course. Good. And I'm sure that you, Alice Mai, have no problem with your protege embarking on the mission. Save for the pain a mother feels when watching her child leave the nest. Whether I do or don't is not particularly important right now, is it? It absolutely is. Panhar's backing of Arturo momentarily blindsides him. Prince Panhard, I... If Arturo's plan is reckless, I want you to tell me. I need a simple yes or no answer. Is the girl capable? Now he knows he's left with no choice. I wouldn't entrust her with all the responsibilities I have if she wasn't. He exchanges glances with me, but his look is different than Samira's. As it's, it's as if he's trying to apologize to me. Here we are then. A recommendation from the Banu Hakim Primogen and the Sheriff. To tell you the truth, I was just throwing out ideas. But with this backing... I can't doubt the Night Clan's representative will get the job done. I'm certain each of us feels the same, Mr. Payne. The atmosphere in the room mostly suggests people are glad they don't have to discuss the topic further. A shrug here and averted gaze there. It is as you say. I will watch the way she handles this situation with great interest. Well then, Miss Sawinski. Looks like you've got your chance for a big break. Just tell me what to do. Nobody asked what I think I have conditions. She's not really in a position to ask for conditions. I'm not going to do that. Again, she's really not in a position to ask for anything else. Um, I'm just going to say just tell me what to do. Yeah, just point me in the right direction and tell me what to do. No point in pretending I have a choice here, is there? Excellent. That leaves us with only one more matter, which I hope we can agree on. Prince Panhard signals someone to come with their hand. Someone with their hand. The figure emerges from behind the corner. Good evening. Catherine, what a pleasant surprise. Nobody informed us you were in town. Addison, looking healthier than ever. And what does Wise have to do with it? We need an impartial observer who everyone respects, and as it happens, Catherine always knows how to make friends on both sides without angering the other. Oh, they misspelled C with a K in <laughs> this side. This one. I beg to diff- I'd be grateful, just for once, you decided against throwing a tantrum about me, High Regent. A painful grimace crosses Ashling's face, but she is quick to interpret the taunt as an invitation to a game she can't possibly win. As long as she can prove herself useful to the proceedings in some way. If half of what I heard about her from Miss Van Vandervaden is true, she should be able to. And what did poor Carter say about me this time? Nothing specific. One always has to read between the lines with him, but it was mostly envy. Miss Weiss gracefully agreed to mediate between the Anarch representative and the Lusamba representative, ensuring mutual cooperation and mitigating potential conflicts. That felt like a Freudian slip. A Samba representative, not Camarilla representative. I.e. someone who can be catapulted from the sect without much damage to the ivory tower if they mess up. Is there a meeting set up? Arturo looks at the clock on the other side of the room. In less than an hour. You'd better hurry, then. What the hell? 
All of this is happening so fast. If the situation is indeed under control, I will drive her and oversee the situation. Out of the question, you got your orders, Sheriff. Attend to those. You fool. The girl needs guidance. And we need yours. Nobody knows what might happen next. But... Oh, Kadir took his mask off. It's not as if the Anarchs have a lot of love for you, Alasmai. You're too efficient in your duties for them to tolerate you. Better spare Miss Sawinski having them see you two together. Do you think my guidance of Julia would be lacking, Kadir? I never said that. So, do you have any objections to putting her under my care? He lowers his gaze, but seems reassured. None whatsoever. That's all I need to hear. We'll be going, then. Wasting no time, as usual, I see. Have you at least tried the aperitifs? Waiting is an old person's game, Helen. I still feel young. Remember, if there's anything you need help with... Probably not, but I appreciate the thought nonetheless. Have a great night, everyone. I'll catch up with you later, Addison. I certainly hope you do. And so we leave, in a rush. Funny, considering what she told me about being in a hurry yesterday. We're here. She thanks the chauffeur and lets me out of the car into a quiet neighborhood, somewhere in Queens. Seemed like you were in a rush. I couldn't stand the crowd. She's honest. Probably performatively so, just to get into my good graces. Well, it's working. Why is that? In my experience, gatherings like those always enable a boring pack mentality. All the familiar lies we tell ourselves to justify lusting for more repeated ad nauseum. What lies are you telling yourself? Yesterday you said, I need guidance. I'll ask her what lies are you telling yourself. She seems like she's lowering her guard a bit. And what lies are you telling yourself? Her aura immediately turns colder. You have bigger issues to worry about, sweetheart. Oh well. At least I know how familiar I can get with her. That I do. Back at the art hole, you said something about guiding me, but I have zero idea what to do. None whatsoever. I had a few necessary arrangements to make over the phone before we got here to ensure your pretty little head stays attached to your neck. For now, anyway. I am grateful, but... I still feel way out of my depth. I need to know what to do. You used to make a living as an investigative journalist, did you not? Investigate the murder. In TV shows where an investigative journalist gets too close to the heart of a politically incendiary case, it rarely goes well. A cat's head on their porch, a bullet to the head. So are you afraid you might be a pawn in a game you don't understand? That your elders consider you a disposable asset? That a single wrong move might cost you everything you hold dear? That sounds about right, yeah. Well, by the sound of it, you understand your situation perfectly. Don't belittle me. I need your advice. Be anything you want, but don't be boring, Julia. If I wanted to belittle you, I would have drowned you in the platitudes long ago. Know thyself. Believe in your strength. Trust no one. Act confident. Turn the chessboard around and read your opponent's mind. Read Sun Tzu and quote him incessantly. Say, do you feel any better now? Can I ask you something? Seeing as Mia is still not here, of course. Do you know who killed Baron Callahan? I haven't the slightest idea. Were you emotionally impacted by his death? Not at all. Did you know him? Only passingly, I'm afraid. I expected him to perish sooner than later, so I never bothered to improve our relationship. Why are you helping me? Am I? 
that remains to be seen. What do you mean? You do not want a painfully honest answer. But I do. She stares me down. Her irreverent tone makes it impossible to guess what she's feeling, even more so than the mask. When I look at you, I see someone pitiful. Someone whose hunger is purely biological, just an animalistic rush. When I saw a burgeoning plan to put you in a situation that is way beyond your capabilities, I offered my help. I was curious to see your true colors reveal themselves firsthand. When everything is said and done and Callahan's killer is pointed out, will you be a whimpering animal or a victor taking the spoils? I cannot wait to find out. I don't know what to say. Is she provoking me or... Mia should be here any second. You have time for one more question. Makes you important. Who is Mia? Why do you hide your face? So I can guess that Mia is probably the leader of the Anarchs, or at least she is someone important in the Anarchs. Catherine, we know she owns at least the property that the Camarilla use. But I don't think that enough is enough to make her... That alone is enough to make her important. I feel like why do you hide your face is too much of a personal question. At this point in time. Especially since I already asked her that question about the lies. Okay, so I'll ask what makes her important. Why do you, what do you do to hold so much sway over this city? I have the best occupation in the world, and I made sure nobody is better at, at it than I am. And that occupation is... a socialite. And that was your last question. Direct the rest of them to her. A woman around my age emerges from around the corner of the street. I've never met her before, but if I had to describe her in two words by her aura alone, I'd guess those words would be permanently angry, even more so than your average anarch. Oh yeah, damsel was just always pissed off. <laughs> you must be Catherine Weiss. And you must be Mia Morgan. Pleasure to make your acquaintance. Pleasure's mutual. This your girl? Julia Sawinski, the La Sombra Primogen. The La Sombra representative. I correct her automatically. At this point, it's a habit. Good, if you're a Primogen, I might have tried to kill you here and now. Is Torque still on the site? Nah, I told him I'd take it from here. By the end of tonight, he needs to look like a new, like a natural candidate for the leader of the NYC Anarchs. It's going to take a lot of driving around and negotiations. How did he react to finding Callahan's remains? He hasn't exactly elaborated on his feelings, but I expect he reacted the same way every true believer in the cause did. It's the, this complicated mess of all the possible feelings under the moon. So he was the first one who the murder so he was the first one who to the murder site <laughs> okay I guess that was a mistake but there oh so you're already calling it a murder site does the ivory tower know something we don't it's not the official position but I expect a lot of them think it's Torque who stood to benefit the most from the boss's death and it sounds like he's quick to jump on new opportunities you don't know him Yes, but I'd love to meet him and ask him some questions. Especially if he was the one who found the body. Well, if you're meeting Torque at all, it won't be tonight. He's too busy. I was assigned to investigate. I won't be able to do it properly if I'm not able to question a key witness. I'll arrange for him to see you this week. This week? Aren't the tensions a little too high for delaying an investigation like this? Well... Torx work is our best shot is making sure they won't get higher, so boo fucking who. I'm his right hand woman though. You got any questions? Direct them to me. 
Maybe the two of you should just head to Callahan's office. The discussion here does not seem to be going in the right direction, nor in a particularly interesting one. You're not coming? Torg and you are not the only ones who have their work cut out for them tonight. I trust you can take it from here. And Mia, be easy on her. In slightly different circumstances, I expect the two of you would have ended up on the same side of the barricades. Uh-huh. Take care. She heads back to her vehicle. Well, follow me. I'll show you his place. It's a 19th century style office. Classical, wooden, smelly. The stuffy air of books, old furniture, and dust covers much of the fragrance of decay, but not all of it. I'm just looking around, waiting for the camera to go around. I don't know, maybe part of me is thinking that there's something in the room that I'm supposed to see. Shattered glass, but where did that come from? This is the first time I've seen the remains of a vampire who has met final death. I've heard stories of really old kindred crumbling to dust, but that's an exaggeration. At least, it didn't happen here. When kindred die, time catches up with them. If you off me right now, I'd probably turn into an ugly, leaking corpse. The Callahan was well over a century old. It's like looking at a dapper mummy. A desiccated body in a heap of musty clothes. All that is, is left of the mighty boss Douglas Callahan, an arc baron of New York City. If that's really him. Oh, that's a good point. It may not be Callahan at all. Needless to say, it might be a little hard to establish the time of death or cause, especially as his garb doesn't have any obvious damage. What a great place to start. Have you already found anything suspicious? Nothing you don't see in front of you. Uh-huh. This door is the only point of entry to the room, right? To the room, right? Yes, unless you count the windows. But no nobody except for Callahan knew how to operate those, and they don't let air or light through. Metal blinders in the windows face east. The only modern element of the room, sticking out like a sore thumb. They look automated. Was the door open when Torque got here? Well, that's the one suspicious thing. It wasn't. It's as if Callahan locked himself in, front in from the inside. A closed room for murder, huh? There's some glass scattered on the floor. I point at it. Could that be from the window? I checked it from the outside. It's in perfect condition. So what's this glass? I have no idea. Why does it seem like she has her suspicions, but is remaining uncooperative just because, a uh, fuck off Camarilla scum? I check the next point of interest, a wall safe. Surprisingly large. I play with the lock a bit. What's the combination? It's Callahan's. What makes what makes you think I know? At least I tried. A desk with nothing but an envelope on it. Nothing inside. I check all the drawers. Every single one has been thoroughly emptied. I don't know what I expected. Is this how the Anarchs go on securing crime scenes? Were these emptied before Torque arrived? I don't know, but I wouldn't accuse him of tampering of evidence if I were you. Well, thank you. The decor of the room is pretty minimal. There's not a lot of points of interest that could illuminate the case. I start getting nervous. I point at the painting on the wall. Of course, you have no idea who that is. Callahan's ancestor, I guess? I'm out of ideas. Everything I look at feels like another dead end. I'm frustrated. I feel as if I have failed this investigation before it has even started. There must be something more. I start walking around, trying to find a single clue. Mia just watches me indifferently. Give me anything. Anything, goddammit. Anything. Any...
A shadow blinks in and out of existence near Callahan's remains. I freeze in place. Trying to help me. I'll say don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of me. The only thing I'm afraid of is you wasting too much of my time. Doesn't seem like Mia noticed it. Give me just a moment more. She groans under her nose and goes back to messaging someone on her phone. When she does, the shadow appears again. Once again, blink in, blink out. Could, could something be there? I approach the clothes and start searching them for a clue. Maybe they missed something. Getting desperate, huh? Just being thorough. We've searched the bastard like three times. He had nothing of interest on him. How about this? A small card, barely noticeable. Looking a bit like a shopping list, is shoved deep into an almost invisible hole in the fabric. I take it out and show it to Mia. Huh. You didn't plant that there, did you? No. Did you? Shove off. What's on it? It's a list of four names. D'Angelo, Hope, Agathon, Tamika. Hmm. Any idea what this is about? Beats me. She's lying, but I don't care. Tomorrow night, I will meet up with Kadir and ask him to help me figure it out. I think I'm done here. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. Guess she sees me as nothing more but an enemy agent. When will I get to meet with Torque? If, and that's a big if, he will agree to meet you on a one-to-one -one basis, Catherine will let you know. He probably won't let a loyal Camarilla lapdog like you see him without her oversight anyway. A Camarilla lapdog, huh? It's a risky play, of course, and might backfire but maybe I'd benefit if I put my loyalty to the court in question. Hmm. Well, who do we actually like in the court? I like Kadir and I like Samira, but other than that, I don't really trust anyone else. Catherine certainly is not, she's in their graces, but she's not part of it. At the same time, we are supposed to be part of the list. Oh. No. What would Beckett do? Beckett wouldn't call himself a lapdog or let himself be called a lapdog. So I'm going to I'm going to put it into question. A Camarilla lapdog, please. Well, aren't you? Trust me, I'm not the type who bites the hand that feeds her, but the court's favorite pastime is leaving me starved. Ah, so it's like that, huh? Okay, I like that. That's true. That's true. They do ignore her. So, I mean, it is true. It's true. She's being honest. Yeah. She studies me carefully. I will keep that in mind, depending on how the situation unfolds. Good. In the meantime, have a good night. You too. It's getting late. Or early, depending on how you look at it. Once I leave Callahan's office, I head straight to Dakota's apartment. I try to sneak in, sneak by to my bedroom, but she's up waiting for me. How's your night? Shit. Tomorrow. What happened? It looks like something the cat dragged in. Tomorrow, I promise. But I'm worried. Don't be. Tomorrow. She gives me a concerned look, then closes her eyes, slumps her shoulders, and frowns. 
right. You're the best. I reach my pitch black room and throw myself on the bed. The responsibilities, the stakes. The way I always feel too slow to react properly in these situations. I don't want to think. I want to turn off my brain. I want to drift into the void. Into the void. Into the void. Into the void. Alright, so it looks like we can still do that. Can we? Oh no, we can't, we can't do that Central Park one, I think. Um, Alright, so I'm going to end this video for now. Uh, the plot is thickening. Um, but let's see where this is going. What are your thoughts about the murder so far? Do you think I was right to throw my, co my loyalty of the, to the camera in question? Um, would you have done anything differently? Um, but let me know in the comments section what you think so far. Who can I trust at this point? Because it's kind of in question right now. I've given you my opinions, but I want to hear your opinions. Um, if you like this video, go ahead and leave us a comment. Uh, hit that subscribe button. Hit that like button. Um, and yeah, just let me know what you think and if you want to see anything more from us. But for now, I'm Amanda. Uh, this is m and and we will see you guys in the next video. Bye!